Let's take a moment and welcome all of our guests that are tuning in from around the corner and around the world and around the country. Welcome to Transformation Church. Let's give it up for our guests who are here. Let's give it up a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facilities partnerships, not only in South Carolina, Lina, not only in Wheaton, Illinois, but in Nebraska, we have correctional facility partnerships where people are watching. Now, wouldn't it be so cool that if the revival we're praying for happens in correctional facilities first, that it's the least and those who've been forgotten that God uses the most so that we would remember the name of Jesus. We believe in y'all. And then to the TC family. Welcome, it is so good. This is uh, 2022, can y'all believe that? Epic, epic, epic. And so we're gonna start a brand new series called It's Time for Different. So we are moving into year 12. In February, it'll be our 12th anniversary. If you were here at year one, let me hear a round of applause, even y'all at home watching. Okay, I know, it's crazy. And so, moving into year 12, this is, this is almost like a, uh, a replanting of Transformation Church. What I mean by that is that we have so many people who have connected for the first time. And so, what we want to do is spend the first part of this year reflecting on why we exist. And our why is rooted in him. And in case you don't know who the him is, is, his name is Jesus, and Jesus was asked the question, what is the most important commandments? And he said this, love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. The way we said here at TC is this, we love God completely upward, ourselves correctly inward, our neighbors compassionately outward. So let me pause there for a minute. Wouldn't you love to have a neighbor that loved God, loved themselves, and loved you. I mean, they'll take care of your pets when you go on vacation. They ain't gonna let nobody break into your house. But on a serious note, wouldn't you like to be married to someone that loves God, loves himself, and loves their neighbor? Well, we don't have to wish for that. God actually wants to do that in us. And who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is gonna be male, female, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, different social economic classes. And so what does it look like to actually love the world? You see, that's God's heartbeat. And so we exist to beat to the rhythm of God's grace to be a loving community that God wants to form love in us. And so we're gonna spend the first few weeks looking at it's time to love God. And you go, well, pastor, I do love God, and, and you probably do, but, but let me give you an illustration and see if I can turn the tables just a little bit. So my wife and I got engaged in college. So the way we got engaged was an Instagram moment, if they had Instagram back in the day, because you know how y'all be doing on Instagram. We went to the mall in Provo, Utah. I don't even know what we're doing there, maybe shopping, I don't know. And uh, we went by a jewelry store, and it was like rings, 50% off or some kind of sale. So we walked in. We looked at some rings. We said, we like that one. The lady behind said, you like that one? We said, yeah. She gave it to us. I grabbed it. I put it on her finger, and we were engaged. <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't like one of these Instagram moments. By the way, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not throwing any shade, but if you do plan on getting married, please spend more money on premarital counseling than you actually do the wedding because the wedding is a day, the marriage is a lifetime. And I promise you, with over two decades of pastoral counseling and marriage counseling, I have yet to see a husband and wife go, okay, we're arguing, but look at our cool Instagram pictures. Seriously, make a true investment. Don't try to impress people. Let God impress his kingdom and his grace in your heart so you can press into each other. That's another sermon for another time. Let me keep on going. But here's the point. Uh, at 10 years of marriage, my wife and I, we just moved to Charlotte. I'm playing for the Panthers. And we were like, we need new wedding rings because, you know, these are old and we bought them on a college budget. So we got these matching wedding rings. It's almost 20 years ago, it seemed like yesterday. And so, but wouldn't it, wouldn't it be weird if I loved this ring more than Vicky? 
Because the ring is a symbol. The symbol isn't meant to be love. The person that it symbolizes is meant to be loved. And then what if I became like what I loved? Well, we actually do. It's time for different. Watch this. Instead of using God and loving things, the gospel calls and empowers us to love God and use things for God's glory. Let me let that sit in there. It's a slight nuance, and for some of you, you're going, wait, wait, wait. So question, do you love God or do you love what God does for you more? Because if you love what God does for you more, there will never be enough to ever satisfy you. Things were meant to be used. God created you to receive his love and reciprocate that love to him, yourself, and others. It's time for different. We live in a culture that will prostitute and pimp God and try to manipulate him to get more things. Things aren't bad until they become God. And when they become God, you become like those things that we worship. It's time for different. But here's a question, though. Teenagers and young uh, uh, millennials and Gen Z, and for those of you not yet in the faith, and, and even for Christians, particularly if you've grown up in the church, you've been told, love God. But why? Why should we love him? And one of the things we're going to find out is it's not really about how much we love God. It's actually about how much God loves us. Because when we tap into how much God loves us, it's like inhaling oxygen, right? We we inhale mercy. We exhale grace. It's not about how much we love him. It's about how much he loves us. So let's dive into that because it's time for different. What we're going to do is we're going to explore Mark chapter 5. Verses 1 through 20. So number one, why do we love God? Because Jesus broke down the sinful walls of racism and built bridges of love. What? So if you're new to Transformation Church, you're like, okay. If you've been around Transformation Church, you're not all the way in, you're like, is he going to talk about race again? And I know I'm going to get an email whenever I do messages like this. I'm going to get at least three, and they're going to say, why do you talk about race so much? And for 12 years, I'm going to write back and go, because the Bible does. You're like, well, where are you getting this from, Pastor? But before we go there, sit with me for a minute. Just put it in park. Take your foot off the gas or brake and just sit, sit with me. We love him because he broke down the sinful walls of racism and built bridges of love. When we think about the conflicts around the world, how many of them deal with cultures and the color of people's skin? Still to this very day. Let me me situate us in the text of Scripture. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Jesus is with his Jewish disciples. On the count of three, everybody say Jewish. One, two, three. They came to the other side of the sea, which is a lake. It's the Lake of Galilee. It's the Sea of Galilee. It's a big old lake. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Gerasenes. What is the region of the Gerasenes? You ready? It's the non-Jewish part of town. So Jesus, a Jewish Messiah, with his Jewish disciples, went to the other side of the lake. Um, They went to the black side of town. Um, They went to the Hispanic side of town. Um, They went to the trailer park side of town. In other words, they went where good Jews were were not supposed to go. In the ancient world, racial tension, even more so than our culture, was bristling with all types of blood feuds. For the Jewish people, the Gonim or the Gentiles, what were they known for? idolatry, the worshiping of multiple gods, sexual perversion. But then think about this. Think about this. If you're a Jewish person and for 400 years your ancestors were slaves in northern Africa and Egypt, how would you feel about people who enslaved your ancestors? And, and, and then when God frees them, they have to go to the promised land, but then they got to mess with the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Prezuvites, and ants that bite. 
So how are you going to feel about those folks who tried to kill you? And then when you get to the promised land, you got the Babylonians who send you into captivity, and now you're in a promised land, and you got the Romans imprisoning you. So if you're a Jewish person, how are you going to feel about people who've tortured and terrorized you for thousands of years? I don't know about you, but I probably would not want to go to lunch with them. But Jesus gets on the other side of the lake to where they are. And the Gentiles did not think very highly of the Jews as well. So Jesus goes to break down walls of racism and to create bridges of love. Now, for some of you, you're going, well, pastor, good thing this isn't a problem anymore. And I'm like, well, think about this. As ancestors of Jewish people whose ancestors did not survive the Holocaust, Who would have thought in Germany in the 1920s when this Austrian named Adolf Hitler was in prison and he wrote a book called Mein Kampf, My My Struggle, where he literally said what he was going to do? Who in Germany would have thought that in a matter of years, precious people made in the image of God would be eviscerated in ovens? So you don't think racism has a problem? What you think about people turns into action. And here's what's sad, is the German Lutheran church, many of whom were in league with Hitler, going, how Hitler, while the stench of Jewish people made in the image of God, filled the air, and they sing, how great our God is, while human beings were dying. Listen, if you're a part of Transformation Church, that's not going to happen on our watch. We're not going to sing songs to God while people are suffering. That is not Christianity. Not going to happen. You can go somewhere else, seriously. It'll be five of us in here, but we'll be faithful. Or the great Jesse Owens, 1936. He goes into Germany and he destroys Hitler's master race. Oh, I know Hitler was mad when Jesse Owens was smoking them cats. I mean, just mad. So Jesse Owens does his thing. 17 other black Olympians representing America win 14 medals or a quarter of the medals for the United States. And guess what they got when they got back to America? Second class citizenship, Jim Crow laws, racism. Jesse Owens said that President Franklin D. Roosevelt didn't even send him a telegram, nor did he shake Jesse Owens' hands or the other black athletes because he didn't want to alienate Southern voters. And I wonder how many of them said the name of Jesus. Now, before we judge them, make sure we ain't doing the same thing. World War II, 1.2 million black GIs go fight for America. 1.2 million black GIs were not granted access to the GI Bill. The original GI Bill ended in July 1956. By that time, nearly 8 million World War II veterans had received education or training. 4.3 million home loans were worth 33 billion had been handed out, but most black veterans had been left behind. A lot of the suburbs that you see out of World War II, massive wealth was created. The way you create wealth is home ownership. Well, guess what? You guys know what redlining is? Banks decided where people of color could live. You ever wonder why certain parts of town look a certain way? It's called redlining. That's history. And how many went to church, proclaimed the name of Jesus, but said, they can't come to my neighborhood. And isn't it ironic Jesus went across the sea? We got to be a people that go across the sea. We got to be a people who go to the other. That's what it means to build bridges of love. Listen, it's not by accident that we look the way we look in here. It take, You have no idea the hell we go through. You have no idea the stuff that was said to my wife and I, saying, you're going to plant a multi-ethnic church? And wait, bruh, South Carolina. Yup. That's not going to work. Well, you don't know my God, do you? Okay. Okay. Now, let me pause here. 
to my white brothers and sisters, you should not feel guilty. You didn't do this. If you feel guilty, you're putting an attachment in a country instead of Christ. Your identity is in Jesus Christ, not in the United States of America. So you shouldn't feel guilty. Now, is it prudent and wise to go, yeah, there were some benefits that we received, but now together we're gonna lock arms and bring heaven to earth as brothers and sisters, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Our world needs to hear this, y'all. There is so much division, but love says, no, nah, no, nah, we're gonna build bridges. And even today, teenagers, in a northern area of China called Xinjiang, there's an ethnic group that are Muslim called the Uyghurs. Their women are being by the, forced by the Chinese government to be sterilized so they can't have kids, forced labor. Also, many are in internment camps where they're being re-educated. This, like, this is happening right now as we speak. The devil has always used our differences to divide. And Jesus uses our differences to display his multifaceted glory. The image of God is located in all of us, and it takes all of us to display God's glory. So don't let politicians, don't let crazy news feeds try to divide what Jesus has unified. Teenagers, listen to this. Let this get deep in your spirit. 1 John 4, 20 says this. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And what's interesting, y'all, about that word hate, in the uh, Jewish understanding of things, that word hate can also mean indifference. It can mean... Um, I tolerate you. Uh, here in the South, we say things like, love you, mean it. And I'm like, hold on, no, no, no. Do you actually know what love means? Love looks like a cross, y'all. Love is bloody. Love is sacrificial. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is, I got your back. You may not look like me, and I may not experience what you experience, but if somebody mess with you, they mess with me because we're in the family of God. Love means I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I am a citizen of the kingdom, and we together are to care immensely about each other. The word love is used too much, and it's too watered down. God's kind of love looks like Jesus. And that's the kind of love he wants us to have. I remember years ago, I was talking to a guy and he was struggling with some racial things. And I said, well, how do you feel about this particular group? He goes, well, I'm okay with them. I said, oh yeah, Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and be okay with your neighbor. Is that what the Bible says? Well, if the Bible says love your neighbors, you love yourself, then ask him to give you some love and when you pray a prayer like that, he will do it. It will challenge us. It will break us down. But God will remake us and remold us. That's why we love him, because he first loved us. Why do we love God? Because Jesus loves dirty people, because that's all he has to work with. Now, let me park here. I know how you feel, because when I wrote that, I got mad at myself. No, seriously, I was arguing with myself like, I ain't dirty, and then I begin to think about things that I did. I want you to enter with me into this because what we're gonna see in light of Jesus, all of us are dirty. You and I will never understand how epic Jesus is unless we realize how jacked up we are. Can I let you in on a little secret? And then after you become a Christian, about two or three years are gonna go by and you're gonna go, I was more jacked up than I knew, but I'm more loved than I could ever imagine. All right, let's watch Jesus, Jesus do some work with his disciples. As soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. So let's pause here. This man had some demonic spirits in his life. Understand this. 
There is a dark, demonic world that is real. It is real. Unclean spirits came out of, uh, came out of the tombs and met him. He lived in the tombs. So let's park here. When you think of the tombs, it's a cemetery. A cemetery stands for death. So here's a man who lived in a place of death. So not only is it a physical reality, but it's a spiritual reality. There is a lot of people who live in a place of death, alive. It's almost like being a spiritual zombie. No one was able to restrain him anymore. So what do we learn from the text? People had tried to help him. Is there people in your life, I know there's people in my life that, that, that we've tried to help, but we can't restrain them anymore. We've tried and we've tried and we've tried. Okay, this is gonna set some of us free. Stop trying and let Jesus. Stop trying and be like, Lord, I can't do it. You gotta do it. It may be a wayward child. It may be a husband. It may be a wife. It may be a son. It may be a daughter. It may be whoever it may be. You go, Jesus, I can't, I've tried. By the way, you and I are not strong enough. There's no nail pierced hands. There's no crown of thorns. There's no hole in the side. We can't save anybody. It goes on. Not even with a chain. They tried to lock him up. It didn't work. Because he often had been bound with shackles and chains. There are people shackled with chains, a physical reality and a spiritual reality. And what did he do? But had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. Let's continue. No one was strong enough to subdue him. There are some people in our lives that we're not strong enough to help. There was no one strong enough to, to subdue him until he met Jesus. On the count of three, say until. One, two, three. There are some until people in your life and my life. They're gonna meet Jesus. Matter of fact, let's praise God in advance for how he's gonna reverse the curse, how he's gonna heal, how he's gonna mend. Let's, let's thank him in advance. There are loved ones, there are people. No one is strong enough until. Watch this. Night and day among the tombs. So night and day in a cemetery and on the mountains. He was always, listen to this now. He was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Let me pause here. In about 2006, seven, and eight, in pastoral care and counseling, I began to hear about teenagers cutting, a, a, a form of self-harm. And I thought it was something new, and then I went back to the text. This is 2,000 years ago. What is the thing that the devil wants to do? He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He can't touch God, he, he can't touch Jesus. He can't touch the Holy Spirit, but he can touch us. And the way that he does primarily is our minds. The scene of the crime is your mind. And what does he want us to do? Destroy ourselves. So I want you to know, know, know this. For those of you who don't think you can go on anymore, God loves you. God has a purpose for you. The world is better with you. You are valuable. You are loved. And I know you've been crying day and night, but I've got good news. The king is going to come. Now, understand this. God and therapy work well. God and psychologists work well. God and psychiatry works well. It's not an either or. It's a both and. Our theology here is all truth is God's truth. You don't have to live in the tombs anymore. First John 1, 7 through 9, and all of us in a way, all of us in a way are dirty. And what I mean by that is we're all born with this virus called sin. Um, any of you guys are fans of the Matrix? Or raise your hands, any of y'all fans of the Matrix? Well, so I'm like a Matrix scholar, according to my son. Because we're, we're, you know, if you train up a child in the way they should go, and so we've been watching, we went to see Matrix 4, and we were watching all the ma Matrix, and I, I'm teaching them, right? And so is my, my wife. We love the Matrix so much that one year, Vicky dressed as Trinity, and I dressed as Morpheus. It was incredible. I would have done Neo, but... 
Oh, we got pictures, sister. We got pictures. So, but in the matrix, you always feel like something's not quite right. We, we always, like something, like if we make a mistake, why do we want to fix it? Um, we, we always feel like, and New Year's resolution is that time that we're like, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to fix this. The problem is we have a problem that we can't fix. Uh, let me give it to you an illustration. And by the way, I am not a good artist. Years ago, I was doing a cognitive, cognitive behavioral theory test for a psychologist. As an NFL player, every few years, I get my brain scanned and checked out. They say I'm partially all right, so I'm good. But anyway, a part of it is you have to draw things. And I'm so bad that what I drew, the psychologist took off his glasses and said, uh, Mr. Gray, have you always drawn this way? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, good. <laughs> so don't expect uh, Van Gogh up here, okay? This is Van Gray. All right, so sin, right? What does sin mean? The word actually means to miss the mark. Yeah, that's Sanskrit. Don't, don't, what you, why, are you, why are you laughing, man? You're hurting my self-esteem. With friends like that, I mean, good gracious. This is an end, people. I told y'all, don't worry about that right there. Don't worry about that. Okay. Okay. Sin means to miss the mark. What is the mark? Jesus is what human beings were meant to be in his humanity. All of us, all of us don't come nowhere close. So we're born broken. The same way some of you are born with red hair, blonde hair. Some of y'all lost your hair. It's a genetic inheritance. Well, we inherited this thing called sin, and it broke us not only vertically with God, but then it ruined our relationships. And so what God comes to do is to create a cross because the cross connects us vertically back to God and horizontally to each other. And so this red paint represents the blood, right? So, so the blood of Jesus washes over our sin. Now understand this, if you're new to the faith, God doesn't just give us a blood bath one time. He keeps bleeding on us and bleeding on us and bleeding on us. So what happens is we are restored. We're restored once for all time and eternity. And that same blood that restores us to God is the same blood that restores us to each other. And it makes this incredible cross. The cross is about a vertical reconnection and a horizontal reconnection. And the blood of Jesus cleans us. So listen, all of us are dirty and none of us can clean ourselves. And so what does God do? He says, I want to give you a blood bath. Stand under the cross and let me bleed on you. There is power in the blood. Look at 1 John. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, watch this now, we have fellowship with one another, horizontal. And the blood of Jesus, his son, does what? Cleanses us of all sin. Hold on, all sin. In the words of Forrest Gump, I'm not a smart man tonight, but all means all. All means all. So question, why do we live with so much guilt and shame if he's already forgiven it, if he's already cleansed it? You know why we do? Because we're still believing the lie of the enemy. The enemy tells you, you're not good enough. You're not lovable. No one's gonna marry you. No one's ever gonna believe in you. You are, you, you are worthless. And God goes, no, no, I don't give my blood to things that are worthless. God's blood not only forgives, but it tells us our worth. If we say we have no sin, uh, years ago when I was an itinerant evangelist, I would travel and speak, and I, I had spoke at Clemson, Man, this was like 2001. It was an FCA event. And I went out to eat with some of the students, and a real religious guy came. And he was like, Brother Gray, I haven't sinned in 10 years. I say, you just did. That's pride and you're lying. That's two. <laughs> like, if you say you haven't sinned in 10 years, you have no idea what sin is. <laughs> and I ate my fried pickles and mind my own business. Verse 9 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive. Notice, not Derwin's faithful. He is faithful to do what? He's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. So listen, you and I may be in the tombs, but he's calling us out and he's going, I'm going to clean you up. For some of you right now, this will change your life. For so long, you've been saying, okay, I'll go to church. It's the beginning of the new year. I'm gonna clean myself up. No, no, no. Let Jesus do it. He's the only one that can. He's the only one that is strong enough. Number three, why do we love God? Because Jesus has destroyed the works of the devil. Mark chapter five, six through 13, look at this. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him and he cried out with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Isn't it amazing that the demonic presence within this man recognized who Jesus was and religious leaders in Israel didn't? I wonder how often maybe we don't recognize who Jesus is. Notice what the demons do. I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told them, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name, he asked him. My name is Legion. Teenagers, a legion in a Roman army was 6,000 men. This man had, this man had over 6,000 demonic attachments to him. He answered him, because we are many. Notice what the demon does here, y'all, and begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. So we've got demons begging Jesus, and you and I are scared of demons. Why? Do you not know who your king is? Our king is the one that begged demons. Walk in the authority that God has given you in Christ. The devil has taken too much from your family and my family. Call on the name of Jesus. Listen, we ain't got time to play, y'all. It is rough in these streets. People are dying. Families are disintegrating. Call upon the name of King Jesus. Even demons have to bow down to him. <laughs> Verse 11. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. How do we know Jesus is not with Jews? Because there's a large herd of pigs. Jewish people considered pigs unclean. Gentiles did not. Verse 12, the demons begged him. The demons are begging again. Send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission. I love that. Jesus like, all right, word, go ahead. That's the kind of king that we serve. And we walking around scared. And God is going, no, no, no. Walk with a humble confidence because we show up with the credit of Jesus, not our own. He gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the Sea of Galilee and drowned there. Can you imagine that scene? 2,000 pigs just poof, and run into the sea. Can you you'd be like, bro, look at this. The pigs are going swimming, and they did. I mean, what a scene. Why do we love God? Because Jesus rescues us from the dehumanizing worship of money. Watch this. Teenagers, grab a hold of this. For those of you that are nine years old, because I had a young man, he's sitting right there. He's like, Pastor, why do you only talk to the teen, 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 teenagers? I'm in here too. I'm like nine. I'm like, all right, so I'm talking to you, Mr. Nine-Year-Old. You called me out, so I'm talking to you. Don't forget this. The men who tended them ran off and reported it in the town and the countryside, and the people went to see what happened. I love this, but it's painful though. They came to Jesus, now watch this y'all, and saw the man who had been demon possessed sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. Oh, hold on a second, woo, woo, woo. Hold on, 
This brother was in the tombs, tearing stuff up, crying, yelling, going crazy. Can you imagine his parents, what they felt like? Oh, my boy. Can, can you imagine maybe his wife, what she felt? M maybe his children. Who knows what it is? But all of a sudden, the man who was demon-possessed and going crazy, cutting himself, got on clothes. He's dressed. For the policeman in here, if I were to ask you to tell me all the stories of you arresting people running around naked and out of their mind, you'd probably have tons of them. Yeah or no? Yeah. And he's in his right mind. Here's the sad part. And they were afraid. Why were they afraid, fam? What were they afraid of? Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs. Then they began to beg him to leave their region. They cared more about the pigs than the man. And one of the servant leaders gave me some insight in the message. He said, not only did they care more about the pigs, but they cared more about the demons in the man. They cared more about losing money than gaining a son back. They cared more about losing money than gaining a father back. They cared more about losing money than a human being made in the image of of God. My question for you and I, how often have we cared more about money than people? All right, immunization shot coming. It's for our good, though. You ready? The average Christian gives 2.3% of their income to the local church. Not the tithe, which is the starting place. 10 10 10% is like the training wheels. Like, God's been so great, I'm starting at 10. For my wife and I, every January, we begin, we pray. 10, 10 we, we haven't, by God's grace, we haven't been at 10% 10, 10 in a long time. We're above that, and we're gonna continue to be above that. I'm not telling you that's what you need to do, but I'm saying for us, how God's been good to us, we want to give back the way God has rescued us because we remember what it was like to be in the tombs. We remember what it was like to be a living dead thing and he made us alive and so we want others to be made alive. And so before we criticize the people about caring more about pigs, let me ask you, what's your financial generosity like to the local church? What's your giving like? I wanna encourage you, a part of your discipleship is your giving. Don't ask somebody what they believe. Just say, let me see your checkbook. Like, oh, no, 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 let me see your checkbook. For where your heart is, your treasure will be there also. My mentor, Norman Geisler, he told me this years, and he said, people make decisions based on money. May we make decisions based on King Jesus, his kingdom, and his gospel. And, and for some of you, you're going, God bless me in 2022, and he's going, I can't even bless you with the money you have. How am I gonna bless you more? I can't even trust you with this. So I wanna encourage you, say, Lord, Give me a revelation of how great you are because I want my finances to reflect that. I want my finances to, re I don't wanna be like the people who cared more about the pigs than a human being who was dressed in his right mind. What about at work? How do you advance at work? Do you betray? Are you the, don't worry, I'll tell the boss. That's a great idea. Hey boss, let me tell you about this great idea I have. Wouldn't it be sad to climb the ladder and realize it's the wrong wall you're trying to get over? That's a come to Jesus moment there, ain't it? But think about it, though. May we care more about human beings than we do finances. Now, is money a good thing? Yes. I've said this for 12 years. I want everybody in here to be rich. You know why? So we can build some hospitals and give some free health care for people who can't afford it. So we can start dental. 
medical, build homes for the homeless, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, bring the kingdom of God to earth. I just wonder, okay, here comes a challenge. And if you're not yet a Christian or you're young in your faith, put this in your pocket. But for those of us who say we follow Jesus in 2022, did you, pay, did you pray, God, give me more? Give me more stuff? Or did you say, God, empty me out? May I give more money? May I serve more? May I be absolutely broke when I die? My pockets are empty when I die because I gave it all to see you glorified. And you know what's interesting? When you pray prayers like that, you end up having more than enough. I don't know if y'all caught that. Let me come back to it. When you actually pray prayers like that, you actually end up having more than enough. It got quiet up in here. Y'all feel that? Jeremiah, you feel that? It was like, ooh, that's all right. I love y'all. Why do we love God? Because Jesus commands and commissions us to join him on mission. He commands and commissions us to join him on mission. Watch this, y'all. This is Jesus. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon, I love that, past tense, who had been, who had been, who had been, who used to, who had been demon possessed, begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Can you see it? Jesus with his disciples is going into the boat and the man's going, Jesus, I want to go with you. Jesus, Jesus, can, can I come with you? Can, can I be with you? See, that's one of the ways that you know you've been rescued by God is that at the name of Jesus, oh my goodness, that something happens on the inside when you think about his love and his mercy and his kindness, that your thoughts, that your actions, that you want your being consumed. A, you just want to be with him. You just want to be with him. Jesus, I just want to be with you. Oh my God, Transformation Church, I pray that we are a Jesus, I want to be with you kind of church. Not Jesus, give me a good job, help me become a better football player, help me, no, 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 Jesus, I just want you for you, I just want you for your mercy, I just want you for your kindness, I want you for your sovereignty, I want you for your holiness, I want you for your grace, I just want you. Oh my goodness. Watch what Jesus does here. Jesus did not let him, but told him, go home to your own people. Okay, this ain't in the text, but I think it could be. Can you imagine? Jakob, get the door. Jakob, get the door. Mom, you're not going to believe this. Mom, you're not going to believe this. Jakob, get the door. Mom, it's dad. Boy, what'd you say? Mom, it's dad. He's dressed. He's got clothes on. He's smiling with a bouquet of roses. Mom, it's dad. Can you imagine that scene? Or can you imagine him showing up at his mama's house. She'd been crying for years, wondering where he's at, not knowing, oh, some of y'all may not know about a grandmother who cried for their children, wondering where they are, looking for the streets, going into dope houses. You may not know about it, but let me tell you about my grandmother that late at night, she would go looking for her babies in the projects of San Antonio, Texas, looking for her daughter, looking for her son, and looking and looking and looking. We got a God who keeps on looking until he finds you. You may not I know about it, but let me testify about him. Let me testify about that kind of God. Can you imagine when he shows up and they go, what happened to you? Go to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Okay, I'm gonna mess with you a little bit, but I love you. This is the way we read this text in the American church. And report to them how much the Republicans have done for you. Report for them 
how much the Democrats have done for you. Report to them how much Black Lives Matter has done for you. Report for them how much Blue Lives Matter has done for you. Report to them how much I didn't have sex with that woman Bill Clinton has done for you. Go back and report how much Made America Great Again guy has done for you and Joe Biden has done for you. It don't say that, do it. It says go back and argue about vaccinations. Well, if the scripture don't say that, why do we do so much of that? And there are millions of young people going, screw that. <laughs> I don't want nothing to do with that nonsense. What do you say? And report how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. Verse 20, so he went out, I love this. He went out and he began to proclaim in Decapolis, which is a Gentile area, how much Jesus had done for him. I love it. Question, in 2022, let's report how much Jesus has done for us because there's a lot of people who need his grace. And they were all amazed. Man, if I could sing, I'd sing Amazing Grace. Hey, but you know what, though? We love Jesus because he loved us first. Our worship team is gonna come out, and we're gonna sing a love song to Jesus and after we do that, I'm gonna give an invitation for those of you who are yet to follow him. Today is your day to say, Jesus, I'm ready. And for those of us who do follow him, it's to resituate ourselves in his love. TC, we're gonna worship one more time, sing a song, pouring our love on our Savior. First loved us, who's given us grace, who's given us power. We love you, Jesus. All things have Breathe. 
King Jesus, those words are a response to your love toward us first. May we be a people that sing that song because we remember the mercy you've given to us. Loving you is not something we do. Loving you is a response to what you have done. We want to adore you. We want to we want to treasure you. We want all of our affections to belong to you. We want to love you with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. Right now in this sacred moment, I believe that there are many that are watching online and many that are physically here. I want to talk to a group of people that You've grown up in the South, you've attended church, you're familiar with things of Christianity, but something hit different today where you recognize that, oh my goodness, I don't know Jesus personally. I, I, I don't love him more than everything. I wanna to speak to a group of people who are saying, hey pastor, I, I, I don't really know what happened other than I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'm ready to be loved by Jesus. I'm ready to be forgiven by Jesus. And there's another group of people. You're skeptical and the, the enemy is telling you, don't believe this, this isn't true. No one can love you like that. Your life can't be changed. I'm here to tell you that that's a lie from hell, that Jesus comes to the tombs and he'll pull you out. He will pull you out, out of darkness and into the marvelous light. He'll do it. So those three categories of people, today is the day that you surrender your life to Jesus. You're surrendering to the one that you've been created for. Today, would you receive his love? Would you, would you receive his invitation? Would you receive his mercy? Would you receive his kindness? Would you receive the life you've been created for? You're not created to be running around in tombs, in a tomb of death. You are created for light and life. If that's you on the silence of your heart, I want you to say this. Say today, King Jesus, by faith, I believe that you were on that bloody, rugged cross for me. You took my place to give me grace. You were disgraced, my shame removed by the precious blood. The precious blood is all powerful. I receive it today. And I believe that on the third day you rose from the dead and when you rose from the dead, you brought me out of the tomb of doom and to life, life eternal. Life in your family, life in your power. You've made me new today and I receive this incredible gift and I choose to follow you all the days of my life. 
In Jesus' name, God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause? You may be seated. Uh, before we do our soul tattoo and action step, if you're watching online by TV, there's gonna be a big old QR code that's gonna come up. Grab your smartphone, open up your camera app, point it at the QR code, and when you do, it's gonna take you to our connection page. And on there, you're gonna see where you can connect with us, but specifically, I want you to check, I pray to receive Christ, or I renewed my faith in Christ. That's gonna to come to our team, and we're gonna be able to help you. We're gonna be able to celebrate with you. We wanna partner with you. If you're here physically and you don't have a physical connection card, on the back of the seat in front of you is a QR code. Grab your smartphone, hit the camera app, point it at that, that'll take you to the connection card as well, and we want you to fill out that information. For those of you with physical connection cards, if you are a teenager or preteen, younger than a preteen, and you don't have a connection card and you pray to receive Christ, let us know. Here's why. We want to celebrate, number one. Number two is we want to encourage you. Number three, we want to support you and help you to grow in your faith. All right? Here's our action step, family. I'm sorry, soul tattoo, forgive me. <laughs> the difference is this. It's not about how much you love God, but how much God loves you. And our action step is this. I wanna speak to the men first. Starting in late January, we're gonna start this 11-week curriculum called Better Man. Better Man is designed to help us become better men. The curriculum was designed by a guy by the name of Robert Lewis. His writings have affected me as a man. His writings have affected my marriage in positive ways. And last year, he said, Derwin, I want you to teach this curriculum. We think you can connect with a younger generation of men all around the country, right? But we wanna start here in our own church. So men, you're not being called out, you're being called up. 11 weeks, I want you to give me 11 weeks to becoming a better man. If you are 13 years old and above, we want you to come. We want you to invite your friends that are men who don't know Jesus. It's time for us to take our place. Now listen, this is no shade at the ladies. Ladies, you're awesome. Research shows that if a husband follows Jesus, there's an 85% chance that the entire family will. Men, there is a calling on your life, and it is time. If you can invest in CrossFit, if you can invest in 70 hours of work, invest in what's most important, your transformation as a man. I am praying for hundreds and hundreds of men that this becomes so powerful that your future generations are gonna say thank you to you, okay? I want you to sign up for that thing. And ladies, we got a mid-sized group for you, for her. Vicky and her team are gonna be kicking it off. We know y'all like to gather. I ain't even gotta fire y'all up. You ready, you're like, when is it? I'm ready, I'm signed up before you even said anything. But seriously though, we want you to get connected. As we grow and mature as a church, we wanna give you discipleship, spiritual formation opportunities. One of the reasons why is this, everybody look me in the eye. You are the answer to someone's prayer. Your growth, your transformation is how Jesus moves on earth. Love y'all, appreciate y'all. Elvis, 1977, I'm out. <laughs>